and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And today we are doing a morning recording. Woo, it's morning, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's not that early, and we've actually been chatting for like at least half an hour before we started <laughs> recording. Uh, but uh, we are, yes, we are both in our pajamas still. <laughs> So, uh, anyhow, there's that fact for the podcast today. There you go. <laughs> I actually haven't even had caffeine today, so <gasps> let's find out what's going to happen, guys. Wow. What are you thinking? I have my tea with me. I'm drinking Earl Grey today, so. Delicious. Anyhow. That's yes. been my go-to this week. Yeah, Earl Grey it's all been day, every day. Yeah, it's been definitely helping. And it's raining at my house. Oh. It's June in San Diego, California, and it's raining. It rained like, up what? here last weekend, which was weird. I'm in San Francisco, yeah. California, and it, we definitely had like rain last weekend. So weird. We and it wasn't on the forecast. We weren't expecting it, and then like, I mean, it's San Diego rain, so it's not heavy, but it was steady. So I mean, it was rain oh, for many hours, and I think it's still going. I mean, to be fair, when I first saw the rain cloud like pop up last weekend, I just assumed it was going to go away because usually they're like, it's going to rain and then it doesn't rain or maybe it sprinkles for five seconds and that was it. No, oh, yeah. it legitimately rained for a while. <laughs> wow. I know. We Californians really can't get enough of this wet stuff that yeah. comes from the sky. <laughs> What's weather, guys? <laughs> yeah, seriously. We have four distinct seasons here in San Diego. Nice, nice, nice and a little chilly. <laughs> um, we go from uh, foggy to baking to foggy. Ah, Those are kind well, of our seasons, especially for summertime. It's like baking hot, foggy, baking hot, foggy. Well, uh, you could move down here. It's quite nice. Can't oh, complain. Don't worry, Zoe. <laughs> We're talking about it. <laughs> Yay. So we should get into the book, though, that we are talking about today for our third episode here in Pride Month. Yes. So today we are going to be talking about Mrs. Martin's Incomparable Adventure by Courtney Milan. Yay. Yes. And so we've already talked about Courtney Milan when we did our governess affair episode. So rather than talk about her bio, I was going to share the author's note that she has in this novella. So she writes, sometimes I write villains who are subtle and nuanced. This is not one of those times. The terrible nephew is terrible and terrible things happen to him because he deserves them. Sometimes villains are bad and wrong and sometimes we want them to suffer a lot of consequences. <laughs> and I appreciated that. And we're going to talk a lot about the terrible nephew in just a second here. <laughs> uh, he really is terrible. There were some points in this where I just was like, God, what is his problem? He was terrible. And yeah, and it is good to see a really terrible villain. And we'll talk more about him at the end. But the book also had a code name because as Courtney writes, all of her books have code names. This one was called Man tears. Because honestly, <laughs> we are all in desperate need of more man tears. Sorry, men. Not all men. But if you needed me to say that, then I definitely meant you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Courtney Milan. Uh, she's, she's so fun. Yes, she really is. Okay. So, did, sorry. Blah. Morning, guys. Good morning. Anywho, <laughs> the main tropes today are the con is on, the terrible <laughs> relation who stands to inherit, and love after loss. Yes. So, I mean, I made up some of those, uh, you know, put them in my own words, but the, the con is most definitely on. The con on. is most <laughs> definitely on in so many different ways. It's fabulous. So many. <laughs> yes. And I really, I, I really was like, oh, the terrible relation. Like, usually it's like the cousin that stands to inherit yeah. the, you know, if, if you don't produce an heir, but <laughs> this time it's a terrible nephew. So anyhow, um, and we have our main characters and they are Miss Bertrice Martin and Miss Violetta Beauchamps. Is it Beauchamps? Bo no, it's Beauchamps. Beauchamps. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. French. Miss Beauchamps. <laughs> Miss Violetta Beauchamps. And again, I am not French. So Neither am if, I. I don't know why I'm the expert on this. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if uh, we're saying that wrong, uh, today it's Beauchamps. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but we're sticking with know. it, guys. We, but we do like to know. We really do. Yes. So shall we get into it? We shall. Miss Violetta Beauchamps has always been one to go along with the natural order of things, maintain the peace, and follow the rules. 
But however fair she has been to others in her life, life currently has been quite unfair to her. And due to that unfairness, she now finds herself about to commit an act of desperation. She has arrived at the house of one Mrs. Martin and is feeling desperately guilty about her plan to swindle her out of 68 pounds. But desperate times call for desperate measures, and while the means may be slightly nefarious, she knows that she deserves the money and that the very wealthy Mrs. Martin won't even notice the difference. However, Mrs. Martin is not at all what Violetta expected. They are of an age, both around 70, but Mrs. Martin is not docile nor anything even approaching polite. She's bold, crotchety, and brash, and puts Violetta's plans on their arse just as they begin. For Violetta has been fired from her job of managing boarding houses, the same job that she's held for 47 years diligently, and has been fired mere months before her 70th birthday, whereupon her employer had promised her a pension. So now she's jobless and in dire need of enough money to live the rest of her life on, and she's figured out how to get it. The cause for her firing, other than her impending birthday and a certain promise, was in the form of Mr. Capish, a tenant who had not paid his rent for 27 months. When her employer had grumbled why the profits were lower, she always pointed to Mr. Capish, but was told by no means was she to try to collect. He was a gentleman, and they would see it paid eventually. But then she had been fired for it, so here she was at his aunt's house to collect the 68 pounds he owed for 27 months back rent, money that would not make it to her employer, but would be enough to secure herself for retirement with the rest she had saved away. She would take the money, and then she would be off somewhere where no one would be the wiser. However, as we said before, the meeting with Mrs. Martin does not go according to plan. Immediately, she refuses to refer to her nephew, Robert Capish, by any other moniker than the terrible nephew. And when <laughs> confronted with his lease, which names her as his guarantor, immediately scoffs at her signature as her first name is spelled wrong. But she does feel badly for Mrs. Beauchamp's who advertises herself as the owner of the boarding house and insists that she is unable to collect the money or evict him as he is a virile, youngish man and appeals to Mrs. Martin to simply pay his debts. But Mrs. Martin has already proclaimed that he has seen the last penny he'll ever get from her. So she mulls over the dilemma and comes up with a plan. Mrs. Martin has been in a state of melancholy since a few of her friends had passed away in succession, including her lover. Her doctor has recommended that she get out of the house and perhaps go on an adventure. So she offers to help Miss Beauchamp's evict her terrible nephew, and once that is done, she will pay Mrs. Beauchamp's the 68 pounds, 12 shillings he owes as long as she promises never to let another room to him. And Violetta, with no other options, decides to go along with the scheme, in for a penny, in for 68 pounds. The ladies arrive in London the next day to begin their assault on the terrible nephew. Violetta is hoping her, that her former employer will be as lax as usual about taking an interest in his business and not hire someone to replace her for at least a few days. That will give her some time to see this plan through. While Miss Beauchamp's had no idea what this plan consisted of, quote, Bertrice had spent the remainder of the journey plotting precisely what she would say to that perambulating bag of male pretension and violence when she first had him in her sights. Unfortunately, though, he isn't at home when they first arrive, quote, rather taking the wind out of her sails to have to wait for the opportunity. They do find him later exiting his club, which is conveniently located next door. They even get to overhear his conversation, which involves the fact that he needs to pay his debts there, too. Eager for her chance, Bertrice gets started, quote, Robbie Bobkins, she says, because she had to say something to get his attention. And she had called him that when he was a very small child and still had the appearance of sweetness. The terrible nephew is shocked to see her, but he gets suspicious when he notices Violetta with her, and he does his best to minimize his aunt, saying, quote, Please, Aunt Patrice, I know your memory is not as it once was, but I prefer to be addressed as Mr. Capish. It's my name. Robbie Bobkins is just a little infantilizing, don't you think? Ugh. But Bertrice doesn't back down. She keeps trying to set him down in front of his fellow club members, but eventually he gets them to return inside. 
He still tries to be friendly and insists they can make amends, but Patrice isn't at all interested, so she lets her intentions fly. Quote, Robbie Bobkin, she said, enunciating the name, saying it as loudly as she could. I am here to make your life a living hell. I have revoked the surety you fraudulently signed on my behalf with regards to the rooms you are letting. You will therefore agree to vacate your living quarters immediately. But the terrible nephew doesn't believe that Miss Beauchamp's will have him evicted. Her reply? Quote, it seems, Miss Beauchamp said, with a quiet determination, that you don't know Miss Beauchamp's as well as you should. The terrible nephew starts to flounder a bit and tries to reason at first, then threaten with his position of power. Which, while he isn't wealthy nor titled, he is a man, and he does his best to use that to his advantage. Blech. Then he even tries an apology to his aunt, saying, See, apologies are easy. Now you say that you're sorry, too. My mother would want you to do it. For her, don't you think you can? But Bertrice absolutely, positively cannot. For good reason. Quote, And Sarah's daughter, Lily, she was taking a course on shorthand while she was helping me along. And you, you utter useless cad, you came to my house and you didn't respect the damn building, you unthinking pile of fetid refuse. She wanted nothing to do with you, and you tried to rape her. I didn't want to see it. I avoided the possibility for years. I kept hoping I was wrong, but you showed your colors, and I'm glad my sister didn't live to see what you've become. His reply simply solidifies his terribleness. Quote, Aunt, those words are so harsh. I've asked you again and again to see my side of it. I'm a gentleman. It wasn't rape. I would have paid her afterward. You've been sheltered. You don't know how these things work. I know exactly how they work, Mrs. Martin said. I have money. You have none. I will make your life a misery. I promise I will. With that, they part. And Patrice now needs to figure out where she will spend her night. Violetta doesn't want to invite her back to her room, but feels she should do so out of politeness. Quote, Do not, Violetta thought, invite this woman to stay with you. She is rich and you have nothing. She is pretty and you are plain. She's clever and you're nothing but a boring woman with a head for figures. You're lying to her and you don't need to like her anymore. But Patrice is thrilled to stay with Violetta, even though it's just a tiny room. After all, Mrs. Martin had wanted to come on an adventure. So they enjoy simple bread with toasted cheese and make do in the bed together. While Violetta is a bit ashamed with what she has, close proximity gives the women a chance to get to know each other better over the course of the next week, while they raise hell together on the terrible nephew. They start by leasing a terrible choir to serenade his wake-up and follow him down the street when he tries to escape. Then they have twelve geese loosed in his rooms. They pelt him with eggs and dust him with flour. They leave putrid cheese in his room and bring goats into his quarters and convince them to eat his undergarments. <laughs> in between tormenting the terrible nephew, the pair grow closer, learning more and more about each other and sharing their thoughts and feelings about life, the universe, being a woman, and getting older. They flirt carefully with each other, although they have both expressed in their own ways that they are interested in women, although Mrs. Martin has expressed the interest in finding a 40-year-old for herself in their past conversations. On one particularly lovely afternoon, picnicking under a gnarled tree, a shift happens. And I'm just going to read a bit of this scene because there's no way to summarize and do it justice. Quote, What a marvelous, beautiful tree this is. It was a marvelous tree, shaped by time and gardeners into twisted labyrinthine splendor. And yet, that one remark stole the air from Violetta's lungs. She felt as if she were punched in the gut, as if all those years of grasping and holding everything in place were suddenly too much. Why? Violetta heard herself ask, her tone just a touch querulous. Patrice turned to her. You don't agree? Violetta didn't know what to think. I just want to know why you think it. Well, Patrice looked at the tree, frowning. There's bark to start. Don't you think bark on old trees is picturesque? It's got, oh, I don't know the proper terms, but it's, it's split. It's got ravines, you know, proper texture. None of that smooth, boring stuff that young trees boast. Something dark and sharp took form in Violetta's breast. Go on. It came out like a hiss. 
Bertrice looked bewildered. Well, then, the shape. Look at that branch there, the way it dips and rises. Or there, where two branches have been rubbed together. Or there. There's a story about the left half of this tree, don't you think? I can almost imagine the gale that stripped away all but the heaviest branches, and they're only now growing back, a thicket of little twigs on a giant oak such as this. Violetta looked at the branches overhead, her teeth gritted, trying not to let her eyes water, trying not to feel, just as she'd spent decades of not letting herself respond to every last insult that she had been supposed to take as her due. All nature is like that, really, Bertrice continued. A boring straight stream is nothing compared to a rivulet that has carved its path deep into the forest, rock work away, banks covered in moss. The human eye is drawn to difference. The tight knot of hurt that Violetta had been nursing all her life flared. It flared into anger and self-pity and dismay. Then, like a wildfire set on a dry meadow, it raced past those simpler emotions directly into confounding rage. No doubt, she snapped. Trees and streams and valleys and beaches alike, all of them grow more beautiful with age. Even men in their own way receive more respect. But it's not all of nature. It's all of nature except human women. Bertrice turned to her, eyes wide. It's not me, Violetta snapped. Nobody praises the texture of my skin now that I'm no longer smooth as a sapling. Over the years, I've grown rounder and more lumpy, but when it's a human being with cares and feelings instead of a tree, I'm considered disgusting. But it's not just age. I've never been beautiful. My eyes cross no matter how hard I try. My hands are so ugly that store clerks wince when I count change. Why is it that everyone can find a bloody tree? more beautiful than a human woman who shares the same properties. She shut her eyes and felt her anger mingle with shame. She reached out, trying to catch hold of her unruly emotions. I apologize for shouting. It's not your fault. It's been like this forever, and every time I think I'm at the bottom of humanity's care, I descend one rung further and discover how wrong I was. There's always another rung. There shouldn't be a bottom. Bertrice's hand was still stretched out, not quite reaching Violetta. There shouldn't be a ladder. The ladies sit for a while and digest this all and more. Finally, Bertrice finishes with, quote, You know what I see when I look at this oak? Violetta shook her head. Centuries have passed, and it's still here. So their ruse and cohabitation continues. Violetta pulls away from Bertrice's gentle advances because she's wrestling with feelings like a liar and also wanting more. More time passes than Violetta expected her former employer to have let pass without a replacement. And all their pranks practically force all the other tenants to move out. So now Violetta is in even deeper with the plan and can't back out. Things escalate one day when they attempt to plaster over the terrible nephew's door, but are interrupted by said terrible nephew, who uses his man status to get the contractors to stop and leave. Then the threatening begins. He threatens to have Mrs. Martin declared incompetent if she doesn't stop. But of course, Bertrice doesn't back down, replying, quote, Every threat you issue, she said, will result in further retaliation from me. I have gone along nicely my entire life. I am done. You, he scoffed, gone along. Nicely. Nice-ish, she amended. He took a step forward. Listen to me and listen well. I will have you declared incompetent unless you write a check upon your bank for 10,000 pounds right now. If you need money, obtain employment. But Terrible Nephew is a gentleman and doesn't believe he should have to work. So he threatens them more, insisting that neither of them are invulnerable. And he's been nice until now. And he will put them both away. Violetta is distressed. Bertrice is fired up. So she visits her solicitors and, as she says, finally, quote, goes on the offensive. They pay a prostitute who was already denying him not to sleep with him, and they amend his nickname to Clappy in front of the ladies. <laughs> and before her final act, Bertrice decides they need fortifications in the form of chocolates. While eating their chocolates, Bertrice tells Violetta of her plan. It starts with a contract to buy the boarding house from Violetta for £2,000. This is in part to make sure that Violetta is safe and has money, if, by chance, the terrible nephew succeeds instead of Bertrice. But Violetta can't accept that. 
because of course she doesn't own the boarding house. And she's grown too fond of Bertrice to swindle her out of 2,000 pounds. And finally, she bursts out, quote, I can't sell you the building. I'm not capable of doing so because I do not own it. I have lied to you for weeks. And if the true owner ever realizes what we have done to his tenants, we shall both go to prison. However, Bertrice's only response is to hand Violetta another chocolate. Because truth be told, she had known that Violetta hadn't owned the building. And in fact, she had bought it on their second day in town together when she had discovered more. Quote, I asked my solicitors, my solicitors to look into it. They brought me the whole story. You labored for Mr. Toggart for almost 50 years, and he sacked you to avoid paying you a pension. It's a typical story. Of course, a man was at fault. Violetta's head is spinning with these new developments, but she still feels terrible for the lying. But Beatrice is insistent that it isn't a big deal and that she understood Vi Violetta's predicament. And with all this out in the open, the ladies can grow closer. And this leads, that evening, to encounter number one, which is a very raw, nurturing, healing encounter that empowers both of our heroines. Afterward, Beatrice tries to get Violetta to sign the contract for the £2,000, but she simply can't. Because if the terrible nephew tries to declare her incompetent, purchasing a property she already owns for £2,000 will certainly add to his credibility. So instead, she forms her own backup plan. The next day, they agree to meet at the apartment building at 3 p.m., each of them with errands to attend to beforehand. When Violetta arrives, she is aghast to see a fire brigade at the ready. For Patrice has decided to set fire to both the apartment and the terrible nephew's gentleman's club next door, which she has also bought. Of course, when Terrible Nephew shows up, he grabs a constable and proceeds to explain that he's in the process of having her, his aunt declared unstable. So will the constable please release his aunt into his custody? But Violetta has Plan B ready in hand. Quote, you cannot release Mrs. Martin into this man's custody because he will not be able to take her. He has owed a great many businesses in the area for years. In order to facilitate their collection, I have purchased 170 pounds of his credit. His creditors had been delighted to get anything at all. She'd received a discount on his notes. This morning, I visited a magistrate and obtained a warrant for the arrest of Mr. Robert Capish. He is to be conducted to the Queen's prison as a debtor. Woohoo! <laughs> Although Patrice had tried this in the past, she had been dismissed because she was a relation. However, quote, Violetta was no relation, and she'd taken great pleasure in holding him to account. And so the next morning at the hearing for Mrs. Martin's incompetence, the prosecution is unable to show up as he is firmly ensconced in debtor's prison. And the judge is actually a good sort and dismisses the case with prejudice, meaning that the terrible nephew cannot bring it against her again, even if he tried. That evening, Beatrice realizes that there's still a loose end. Perhaps one day when her terrible nephew manages to get out, she will pass and he will find his way to her money. So she decides that she needs to spend it all and offers the prostitute they saw earlier a job for 300 pounds a year to spend 30,000 pounds helping women. The smart lady takes the offer. And later, the ladies retire to Violetta's house after some more honest conversations and declarations of love that lead them to decide that they'd like to continue in each other's company from here on out. And then we have an epilogue. A year and a half later, the ladies are living in Boston and enjoying life. The terrible nephew has been released from debtor's prison to his own demise. He had gone to her former bank and tried to forge a check, but was caught in the act and immediately sent back to prison for another 10 years. Isn't that gloriously appropriate? But our ladies are joyous, healthy, and together, and living quite happily ever after. Oh, so shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall. So today we want to talk to you guys about Blush Magazine. And as a reminder, Blush, it's not a subscription. It is totally free. Yay, free stuff. <laughs> yeah, free romance stuff. So we love that. And as a reminder, Blush is a digital magazine that takes readers beyond the pages of their favorite books to meet their favorite authors. It's focused solely on the romance novel industry. 
interviewing authors, following trends, delving into tropes, and the many intricacies specific to the romance genre, and provides insightful, thought-provoking, and fun editorial content on a monthly basis. So head on over to bit.ly slash blush magazine to learn more and check out the latest issue. Yay! All right, guys. So we wanted to talk a little bit more about our book recommendation section today because um, as we posted a couple of weeks ago, we really want to make a conscious effort on this show to promote more works by authors of color, especially in our genre. We are going to be doing better to include episodes where we review books written by authors of color in the genre and also feature characters of color as the main characters. So we are working on our programming upcoming to make good on those commitments. But in the meantime, we wanted to talk a little bit more about our book recommendation section. So when we first started this podcast, we wanted our book recommendation section to be full of diverse recommendations because we know that historical romance the Regency romance genre, uh, you know, Victorian and Georgian Regency, which is what we love to read, is overwhelmingly white and straight. So we wanted to have a section where you guys could reach out to us and help us and our listeners learn more about diverse books or other other books that are great that we should be reading. And maybe we haven't made this clear, but we didn't mean for the book recommendation section to only be about historical romance, only be about Regency and Georgian and Victorian. As you know, Kelsey and I pretty much get stuck reading in this genre. But we've both been exploring outside the genre this year, and especially since we started this podcast. And we would love to hear from you guys all about romance books that are diverse. So it doesn't have to be just, you know, historical romance. We really want you guys to bring us books and recommend us books that you think that everyone should learn about, especially from authors of color, and especially about characters of color. And even better, authors of color writing characters of color. So we'd love to hear your recommendations for those books. And so we are going to be, we we hope to hear from you all. And we're going to be featuring some different authors that maybe uh, we can learn a little bit about and you can learn a little bit about here in the parlor moving forward in the month of July. Yes. So if you have any of those recommendations, please send them to us through our email at romancepod at gmail.com. You can also send these to us via social media. We're on Instagram at T and Strumpets. T is in Tom and is in Nancy Strumpets. We are on Twitter at the same, on Facebook and Pinterest slash T and Strumpets. And on YouTube, you can find us by searching our name. And of course, if you really want to be in the know, you can sign up for email notifications on our website. If you subscribe, you're the first to know what we're reading each month. Plus, you'll get all sorts of extras, including exclusive content from each of the authors who join us on the podcast. Our website, again, is romancepod.com. And there you can find episodes, more information about us, and other resources. So take a look. And finally, please rate, review, and tell a friend. Reviews on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or anywhere else you can review us really help other listeners find the podcast. And word of mouth is also one of the best ways that podcasts get found. So if you like what you're hearing, we'd love for you to spread the word. Hi. I'm Laura Von Holt from the Mermaid Podcast, part of the Frolic Podcast Network. The Mermaid Podcast is, you guessed it, all about mermaids. I cover everything from mermaid legend and history to mermaids in pop culture, movies, and TV. My guests include mermaid experts, mermaid historians, mermaid authors, mermaid charities, mermaid tale makers, and even professional mermaids. Yes, being a mermaid is a real job. It turns out that talking about mermaids is kind of like playing that Kevin Bacon game. You start with mermaids, and within six degrees or less, you end up connecting mermaids to almost any other topic in the world. Things you never would have thought of all lead back to mermaids. Like religion, and mummies, and a few English queens. So, whether you have legs or fins, are a mermaid queen or a mermaid at heart, the Mermaid Podcast has something for you. 
You can find us at mermaidpodcast.com and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. So let's talk about Mrs. Martin's incomparable adventure. Yes, let's chat about that book. Yeah, so there were a lot of things. You know, this is, on the very surface level, this is an, a queer romance, mm-hmm. right? It's a queer historical romance. But, like, there are so many other themes yes. that Courtney Milan kind of explores here. Like, she's talking about, you know, the pa- power disparities between men and women and rich and poor because we have, you know, the the wealthy Mrs. Mm-hmm. Martin and the very poor um, uh, Violetta and also young and old, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's a lot of that. So it's just like you're getting a lot of bang for your buck in this little novella. Absolutely. But like, I think that's very consistent with Courtney Milan. She likes her novellas to pack yeah. punch. <laughs> oh, God. She is a master at it. Like, seriously. So how did how did you like uh, the experience reading this book? What was it like for you? Um, I... I really liked it. I thought it was a bit simple and sweet, but like the terrible nephew, even though he really didn't do a lot, was just so Mm -hmm. terrible. And I just wanted to bash him over the head with like a frying pan. Yes. And I thought it was really – it was a very cool villain from Courtney Milan, and I loved her author's note. But I thought it was such a cool villain because, like you said, he didn't have to do much. He just simply stood in his fucking – man position of power Mm -hmm. and like basically was trying to use his authority and strength to subdue these women and to get what he wanted and it was disgusting and lecherous and it was so villainous without having to do much and it was because in like his mind like even though the money was his aunt's like she had inherited it from her late husband it's her money but -hmm. because he's her nearest relative and his mother had left him money as well and he just spent it all very quickly Mm -hmm. and in his mind the money that his aunt controlled was really his money she was just taking care of it until she died like, it's his money, yeah. though. So the fact that she's not paying his debts is like, how dare you? Like, you're not letting me touch my money. But it's hers. It's not even It's not even remotely his. Yes. It's not. And But he's just, it's, again, he's in that man position of the time, too, where he just thinks that because he is man, he is better. Oh, my God. Zoe, oh, I'm going to point to one thing and you include it in there. It wasn't rape. I was going to pay her. I know. And I was like, let's just like that line says it all. Because you assume that a woman of less social standing than you cannot be raped. Because if you throw a coin at her, then it's just then it's just paid sex. So now you've just made someone who wasn't a prostitute a prostitute because you felt like it. What the fuck? And I couldn't quite tell if there had been a rape or not. At first, I thought he had raped her. But then, like, when I went back and was, was reading the quotes, I was like, I'm not no, sure he did. but it still attempted. Like, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Attempt- the fact that he attempted it. It doesn't matter. The fact that he just <sighs> assumed that he could have sex with a woman without her consent, because if he was willing to pay her, that was fine. Oh, it's it's despicable. And I mean, it's terrible. And, and don't even get um, me started on the history of women being thrown in insane asylums because they wouldn't keep their mouths shut. Oh, God. Like, right? I mean, oh. I just, that dry. Like, I read, like, when it's reading that, and it's like, oh, honestly, I was thinking about the whole insane thing, like, the entire time because I knew he could do it. And I just was yeah. like, oh, my God. Like, oh, my God. And oh, look, there he is going to do it because he's a fucking man and someone's not giving him his way and he's a gentleman and therefore he's not required to do anything except like exist. Yeah, I found the book a little stressful because there's a lot of there's a lot of humor in it that kind of downplays things. Um, Mrs. Martin is a hilarious character, yes. and kind of Violetta as 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 her little sidekick is is also great. Like they play very well off of each other. But um, I, there, I found it very stressful because I did feel like this man is gonna 
beat them or subdue them or they're just going to disappear one Mm -hmm. day. And I think that's what Courtney Milan wanted us to feel. Like, I really think that's what she wants us to feel. And then, you know, I'm also, you're also worried because you're like, oh my God, like, what if the landlord comes, you Mm -hmm. know, like, what if he comes back and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? You got all my tenants out. Like the game plays for so long. I start to, I started to feel stressful. And then Courtney Milan does what she does every time where she pulls in some sort of Mm -hmm. twist you didn't see I didn't see the whole I bought no I didn't see it no it and it was so smart because of course Mrs. Martin would have gone and been like this doesn't make sense well, she's and there's so like smart. a little hint to it where she was like hmm I have a like she stays the night with Violetta and she's like hmm I have to check on something I must see my solicitors tomorrow and she just like says it in her own head and then yeah. that's the only whiff that's the only whiff you get of it but yeah, so you just – and she's seeing her solicitors frequently, so it, you don't kind mm-hmm. of think of it. But it's so – it was so brilliant that she's just like, I have all this money. I'll fucking buy the building. Like, that's fine. And then just – no, and then just being like, I'm not I'm not going to confront her about this. We're just going to have our adventure, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I forgive her already because this fucking man took her life from her. Oh. Like, literally because he just didn't want to pay out. Literally, oh. which is just like – it's just the sad, horrible truth. And the thing is, like, people still do that shit today. They do. They find it's a reason so, to I, fire you because you were promised a pension or you were re- promised something for retirement. And then they're like – Eh, we don't see it worth our time to pay you that. So, oh, reason over here. Oh, sorry, you're fired today. Yeah, it's it's terrible. And luckily today there are some laws that that help people in certain states uh, in the United States at the very least in these kind of situations. But it's not a guarantee, and it's it's, it's difficult and expensive to fight those sorts of things. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, it's just like all of the injustices and the power imbalances. That she brings to light here in such a short space are really great. And I think like, yes, do I really like feeling that stress when I'm reading? Like, no, not really. But after reading it, the way like I realized mm-hmm. kind of the journey and talking about it, I'm like, oh, that was really smart and clever. Like, yes. that was and, really clever. And luckily, this is a novella, novella so you knew the stress was going to be over fairly quickly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I know I read like the whole scene, but we have to talk about the tree. We have to talk about the tree. Oh, it's such a beautiful, like, <sighs> it was literally, I mean, it is the perfect metaphor. It, it is. It really is. It feels like the thesis of the book, right? Mm-hmm. Which is that, you know, even amongst all these power disparities, the kind of one of the, the biggest themes that comes forward is, you know, older people finding love. And there there was another line somewhere, I didn't include it, where it was just like, you know, sexual desire like doesn't go away just because mm-hmm. you have wrinkles or something to yeah. that effect, you know? Mm-hmm. And and that people expect that when you are of a certain age, then all of a sudden you're sexless, but that's not the case. No. And I just think it's really, it was just really beautifully done. And like, you cannot read that scene about the tree and not just be like, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 100% agreed. It was really, really beautiful. And I'm just going to stick. Yeah. yeah, Just the, the, I just, the, the care of the description and the talking about it and how, you know, it's still there. It's withstood centuries and it's still there. Mm-hmm. Like and that theme came back in the book. I didn't. I didn't keep it in the synopsis, but uh, Violetta was like, you know, that's what she she'll do. What she's always done, which is keep going. She will still. She will remain. Basically, was and and it, there was reflection in, in the in the phrasing that came later that I was like, uh, this is referring to her having that moment with the tree and saying mm-hmm. like, I will stand strong. I will remain. I will, I will keep going and I yes. will still be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, so that was cool. Um, yeah. And like I said, I thought the book had a lot of humor. It did have a lot of humor. Bertrice is hilarious. She's really I funny. I love her. She's really funny. And then Violetta like kind of gets her voice and she's like, yeah, fuck it. I can say these things too. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like their pranks are are silly and funny and fun. Um, the choir. 
<laughs> a um, choir, the choir that was like very bad. Great. Yes, uh, waking him up and following him down the street, and, and then running after him down the street. <laughs> yeah, singing Robbie Bobkins because that's what Violetta told them to start singing. Yes. I mean, it's so petty, but it's also like it's it's. It's in some ways it's so funny and wonderful and then in some ways it's kind of depressing when you think that this is this is what the women had at their disposal, right? Yeah. You know, these are the tools they had. They're going to peck at him, right? Uh, mm-hmm. and, until he finally cracks. And mm-hmm. it's not a bad tactic at no. all. But it is also sad that even like, you know, a rich lady can't just be like fuck this man, you know, uh and, you know, he yeah. he get him out of here. Like, they had to resort to all that because, you know, the law and people around them weren't going to help them. Mm-hmm. So they did it. And good for them. Yes. Very good for them. So let's talk about our main characters and our heroine ratings. All right. Um, let's start with Patrice. Shall okay. we? We shall. <laughs> Um, so I, again, think Bertrice is a cool character. She's depressed when you first meet her. Mm -hmm. She's been very melancholy and uh, angry because she's lost three of her good friends, I believe, and then her lover, or her Mm -hmm. lover might have been one of those three, Yeah, uh, in quick succession. And that's a very hard thing to go through. And now she's very alone and bitter. And so then she goes on this adventure. She has fun. She was reminded that, you know, there's a lot of life out there to live. And she's got a billion great lines. (laughs) So a billion great lines and an obsession with cheesy toast. (laughs) So, yes. I mean, who does it? I mean, honestly, like, it was very hard for me not to include all the passages about cheese toast because, (laughs) and they, like, some of them, I was literally sitting here like, I'm going to go get some cheese toast. Like, yeah. <laughs> I need to – because, like, there were some long passages about cheese toast where I was just like, I just need to eat this toast with right? cheese on it. Oh, it sounded so good. Um, so, yeah. So, I have a number in mind. Do you want to talk about her before I share my number? I mean, my thoughts are very similar. Like, I just really liked her um, – I just – I really just liked her no-nonsense attitude and, like, I do see her – she reminds me, I think, a little bit of my own grandma in a way. Uh-huh. Who is, like, very similar. Like, my grandma's way older than Mrs. Martin is, but, like, she's just, like – she's a very staunch lady. She has her opinions and she's not afraid to tell you her opinions. Nice. <laughs> like, and that's who she is and I love her for it. And so, like, Mrs. Martin kind of, like – I just saw my grandma, like, Aww. in that – kind of respect so i really really liked her but let's let's share your number so i am going to give her an eight i think she's a great character she's interesting and she's funny and uh i just i enjoyed her she's very forthright i think i'll agree with that eight i really nice. enjoyed her as a character i really did she's quite fun and then what did you think about violetta so violetta I I really kind of understood her plight. Like, this is a woman who has, you know, scrimped and saved and struggled her whole life. And and, and she's she's disabled, or what would you call that? She's disfigured. Um, yeah. She's, I'm not sure if you call it disabled or disfigured, but she has um, a very, I guess what we call it today is a lazy eye. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a term I should be using that's different than that. So apologies if if that's not the, the current term for it. But she has one eye that crosses and she can never quite focus both of her eyes on the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it it isn't mentioned that much in the book. It's mentioned, I think, twice, once in a quote I included and once kind of in the beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't really include it because – it's kind of an interesting, like, sub-character characterization. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. not what defines her. No. And she doesn't let it define her. Mm-mm. But it is a struggle for her. No, it's a struggle. It's it's something she's fought, and it's something that, like, kind of never allowed her to get the positions she may have wanted for herself. Mm-hmm. And she also, you know, she is descendant of people who fled, like, her parents fled um, the terror in France after the mm-hmm. revolution. So they were, as she puts it, you know, they were noble enough to be under threat, but not noble enough that they came to England in style. 
you know? Yeah. Like, and, they, and they weren't accepted by the aristocracy here yes. in England. Exactly. Like, they were never accepted. So they kind of lived not even a gen... Like, it sounded like they lived more of a genteel poverty, like, with the money. But then eventually the money ran out when a, Violetta was reaching adulthood. So she kind of had to then go work for her money. But she was never too proud to work for her money. And mm-hmm. in fact, she you know, relish doing a good job. And that's why being fired was so, um, which was just devastating to her was because like she'd been working for this person for almost 50 years and had been promised a pension and then to be fired for something that she had tried to prevent. Uh, it's just the injustice. Like the injustice of it all. And and she knew it was just so he wouldn't have to pay the money to her. Oh, yeah. But that's just like her feeling helpless. But, you know, like she said, she's like, I will just keep keep on keeping on like I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna go anywhere like I'm not gonna go keel over and die tomorrow so like I've just got to figure it out and I really admired that small strength in her because like she was kind of demure and like really wasn't like outspoken but that was just part of her circumstances and Bertrice and her like they have this great conversation about Bertrice being like because Violetta's like I'm not bold and like brash like you like I don't you know fight and she's like because you couldn't I have money that's allowed me to fight and have those opinions like you have relied on other people to provide you with a living and so you cannot afford to have those types of opinions and outbursts Mm -hmm. and I think that I kind of admired like the opposites that were between the two of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think like their juxtaposition made it more interesting. Like their their different backgrounds made it more interesting, but also like the things that they had in common is what brought them together. And that was such a great, I think it's like such a great foundation for a relationship, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, they really had... They had a a build up to being together that made total sense. Like mm-hmm. they meet, they're very different, but then they learn the things about each other that uh, that are the same and that they have in common. And then they, you know, they have a an act together that they do. They they do a thing together that brings them mm-hmm. closer together. Uh, and then then they fall for each other. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. like it, it's a great. It's a great natural feeling um to their relationships so mm-hmm. and it never um, it didn't feel rushed or like oh just circumstances you know it was very much like they worked together and learned about each other yeah and at the end of the day they're like we should just keep doing what we're doing so what would you give uh violetta you know what i'm gonna give her an eight as well yeah i came into this and i thought i was gonna give her a lower score but then i just the more we talk about it i agree i think she's an eight i think these characters are really interesting and i want to see more characters like this Mm -hmm. on the page so i think she deserves an eight um all right so now we're at our favorite quote and i mean this book is like eminently quotable as very always is she's so good and funny and interesting so, yes. Anyhow. Hang on. Um, I you can go first. I got to pull up my stuff. Okay. So I could pick 70, but I'm going to pick this one, which I really liked it. Um, this is Bertrice talking about um, uh, just her, her husband and her life with him. Mm-hmm. And she said, my husband, God rot his soul, used to bring prostitutes home all the time. After he'd finished with them, I'd serve them tea and double whatever he was paying them. It's good sense to be, and then uh, when she's asked why she did that, she says, it's good sense to be kind to people who are working for you. It was hard work fucking my husband. Trust me, I should know. I certainly didn't want to do it. <laughs> I just loved that. I'm just uh, like, oh, Patrice, you're so good. Um, and there were some other like sadder kind of quotes too. Yes. I have one of those. All right. Um, Yes. Um, I'm going to go with one that's a bit more lighthearted. Okay. And it's uh, Patrice is saying this about herself. The word for people like you isn't nice. It's, and she's talking about Violetta. This is when they're kind of talking about their differences and their stations in life. And she's like, the word for people like you isn't nice. It's not massively wealthy. I may be a cantankerous pain in the arse, but when someone tries, when someone explains a thing to me, I do try to listen. Oh, 
So good. And there so so the the sad one that I wanted to share too is Patrice is saying, I've screamed on the inside too. I've screamed on the outside. I've screamed until I thought there was nothing left of me but my voice. And then I lost my voice and I still kept screaming. And it's just like this kind of perfect encapsulation of like the struggle of woman, you know, Mm -hmm. throughout the years. And like, I just feel like a lot of us can probably understand that even like in silence when you're still screaming. Yeah. Like, uh, just some some really beautiful writing uh, Mm -hmm. in this book. Yes. So this one was um, the first time that Bertrice has the cheesy toast and mm-hmm. like she's been in a depressive thing. And I just thought this was a really good kind of explanation of like that feeling of depression and like or melancholy, as she says, like she's been in a slump. And so she says it had been so long since she'd felt anything like hunger. She had been eating mostly because she was aware that putting food in one's mouth and swallowing it was a thing one was supposed to do if one expected to persist in a living state. She hadn't been hungry. And this beautiful moment of watching Violetta, like, cook the cheesy toast, all of a sudden she's like, oh, I'm hungry. What? Yeah. I hadn't realized I wasn't hungry. And I know that feeling, it's like, that feeling of just, like, being tired all the time. And then one day you wake up and you're not tired and you're like, oh. Is this what it's like to have energy? Like mm-hmm. I forgot what that was. Yeah, it's uh it's definitely relatable as so much of what Courtney Milan does. Uh, obviously, uh, I love Courtney Milan. Any yes. <laughs> I don't think that that's a secret. <laughs> so let's go on to our steaminess rating and our encounter counter. We had one encounter. Uh it was a long encounter. It was um, a long encounter. I didn't expect it to be that long. <laughs> no. Neither did I. I and actually that's what that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. So I did not I personally did not find this book very steamy. No, um, I did the not. The sex either. scene is pretty explicit. Like it, it's very detailed. It's very mm-hmm. long. Um I just found that like a cup of tea that's just a little bit too cold. Yeah. Just a little bit. I'm on the same page with that. Yeah, for sure. So and when you said yeah, when you said it was really long, I, I also thought it was long. I almost expected a fade to black. Uh-huh. Not that I wanted that. I think it is great that there was a sex scene between two older women. Like that's that's great to see in a book. Um, I just it almost felt a little bit incongruous with like the rest of the book, you mm-hmm. know? I, I Yeah, I, it seemed like it was yeah, and it was like, I don't know, I think I expected a fade to black too, because like it had kind of come off this like really sweet moment, mm-hmm. you know, and then like it was a joining and then it kind of like, it almost set itself up to be a fade to black. Yeah. And then it continued. And then you're like, oh, okay, like, I don't mind. Like, that's fine. Like, yeah. And it was good, but it wasn't like, I didn't, I didn't think, I think I would have enjoyed the scene. Like. More. Not necessarily a fade to black necessarily, but like I, for me, a less is more would have felt more in, like, it would have felt more natural in that scene. That's how I felt too. And then I kind of like was wondering, I was like, is this like some sort of inherent prejudice that I have where I'm like sort of uncomfortable reading about old women having sex with each other? And I was like, I don't think that that's the case. This is the first time I've read about old women having sex with each other. Yeah. So, like, is it that I feel uncomfortable because this is something new, you know, that I'm experiencing? You know, mm-hmm. I was, like, trying to ask those questions to myself. Like, <laughs> are these – am I being prejudiced? Do I have an inherent prejudice here that I just don't know? And is that doing it? I I, I don't really have the answer to that, mm-hmm. you know, I, but I, it's something that I tried to think about. Um, but I really did feel like the scene just felt like a little bit longer than it needed to be, mm-hmm. um, which didn't make it feel more steamy to me in that yeah. case. You know, like, I think, like, I felt like, okay, <laughs> like, we're still going yeah. <laughs> rather than like, oh, wow, that was very, like, you know. Yeah. Well, Yes, and I I agree. But, you know, and I've read other books that are just normal, you know, straight books, you know, between two characters. And sometimes I'm like, I didn't need that. That was just like. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, I I didn't need the whole thing. Like, I I needed a part of it, not the whole thing. 
For sure. But I think that, you know, Courtney Milan set out here to be like, to, to do something specific, which is mm-hmm. like to write a book about all of the things we've said, but especially, you know, about an older romance and to not like skirt any of the the sex part like i i think it's she's like i'm here i'm writing about sex with old people because we should write about sex with old people so like i think that that's important i think it's good that she did that so mm-hmm. um anyhow i just i didn't personally find it that steamy i still yeah so one thing i did find it was very feminist <laughs> oh hell yeah hell yeah i mean like we said the power struggle between uh, men and women and young and old and rich and poor like this it book brought was all like, of it to light and it was yeah. talking about it and it was you know it confronting you it but then also it. like yeah it made you think about it but then i mean like this old lady just decides to hire a lady of the night to like spend all her money for her she's yeah. like get get, get cracking yeah, I think that was my least favorite part of the book. I mean, I loved that she was like, I'm going to spend all my money so that when he dies, he has none of it, you know? Or when I die, he has none of it. But I was like, the, the prostitute thing felt just like a little bit of a throwaway no, to so me. F- no, for me, like I liked it. It was more, well, because it was a decision kind of made on the spot, which Bertrice is known to do. Yes. And she even says after it, she's like, after my solicitors untangle this like mess I've created, because yeah. I didn't think it through. Like she acknowledges that it was a very spur of the moment decision that she did, maybe could have thought through a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> but I just like it too, though, because I thought it was really um, fantastic, but also just a nod to like poor and like what it meant to be poor in that time, because she's just like... You know, she goes to Molly and she's like, I think her name's Molly. She's like, how would you like to learn a respectable skill? She's like, what makes you think I don't know a respectable skill? Yeah, that's true. And I was, and she's like, you're right. That was my own prejudice. Sorry. Like, yeah. she's like, I find this pays better. It's like, fair, fair. Yes. You know, okay. All right. All right, Kelsey, you talked me around to it. <laughs> I I like it more seeing it through your eyes. And I wanted to say also that as far as, you know, feminism and intersectional feminism, I felt like this book made me stop and think and wonder, you know, do I have some prejudice that I, you know, have to learn about and and realize? And so, like, Mm -hmm. anytime a book does that and makes me think, like, that's to me a really feminist book because it's helping me grow as a person. Uh, Whether or not I find out that I am prejudiced about something or I Mm – or I. You know, just the fact that you stop and think about it, that's always a mark to me of a of a good book. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, this was a supporter. <laughs> yeah, very much a supporter. Ugh, I'm just thinking about that scene again of like, sorry, we didn't even talk about this. There, yeah. When they when Bertrice talks Molly out of like having sex with him, mm-hmm. it's because he m- Clappy over there was literally trying to tell Molly that she should sleep with him and he would pay her like double later. It's an investment. Got, it's an investment opportunity. Yes. Literally, like he thinks so highly of sex with himself. He's like, it's an investment opportunity for you. And like then she comes back, like when Miss Martin asks her, like, uh, you know, does she want to do it? And she's like, well, he's fast but boring. I certainly won't do it for free. Yeah. <laughs> like, I yes. just was like, no. yes. Oh. oh my God. So good, right in front of his face. So, anyhow. No, there's a lot of moments like that in this little novella, right? Mm -hmm. Like, this is a short novella um, and 112 pages. um, It's very short. But with a lot of substance. So Mm -hmm. are we ready for our final book rating? Uh, Yeah, let's do it. Do you know what you are going to rate this book? Um, I'm going to go with an eight. Why is that? Great rating. Um, I just, I liked all the parts of it. I thought it was funny. I thought it had some drama. I thought it had some really sweet moments. The characters were fabulous. So I'm going to give it an eight. I am also going to give it an eight. And I came to this recording 100% ready to give it a seven. (laughs) But, you know, I've talked myself up because of all of the things that I've realized this book has made me think and done and, and how important I think this book is. And I think like, This is a really important book. Mm -hmm. Did I love this book? No. I actually Mm. didn't, like, love this book. But do I love what this book made me think about? And do I love the things that this book did? 
yes. And so Mm -hmm. like that should be celebrated and that should – just because it didn't resonate with me, like sometimes those other factors push it up. You know what I mean? And sometimes they push it down just depending on like, you know, Mm -hmm. the the book. But for me, I think this book is deserving of an eight. Now, something that I think is interesting is I don't think this is one of Courtney's like best written books because I, I've read a, I've read most of her books. I think you've mm-hmm. read a couple of her books. Yeah. And when I started reading the um, like the excerpt from The Devil Comes Courting, which is her upcoming book that still like was supposed to come out this year but hasn't come out this year, so maybe it'll come out soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I started reading the excerpt and it, I was swept away within like three Mm -hmm. lines and it was just, there was something like really poetic to it and just the flow of it. And it felt like really, really powerful Mm -hmm. and just a way that I know her writing to be that even though her writing was like fabulous in this book, it just didn't have quite the same like flow that it had in some of her other books. When I read this book, I wasn't usually, like when I, when we were reading The Governess Affair, like swept was, away swept away this yeah. i wasn't really swept away in like yeah in fact i actually started it went to bed and then finished it like two days later like yeah it, it didn't it didn't sweep me away but i still like love everything is doing loved no. talking about it loved all that i just mm-hmm. there was something about it that wasn't like quite as a uh, perfect as some of her other books which i just think like have this this just I don't know, like feeling to them. And I, Mm -hmm. I, again, highly recommend this book. I think this is a book that everyone should read. Like I said, it's also short. So it's like, you know, what are you doing not reading this book? Because I think it really does make you think. And Mm -hmm. that's what we want to see in our romance. Yeah. Romance is is a a reflection of like the human condition with a happily ever after. Like, Mm -hmm. it's why we want to read it. It's why we like reading it because it's talking about people in life. Yes. And I mean, I feel like we've also talked about how we want books in historical romance that are pushing the boundaries, that are showing Mm -hmm. different stories, um, changing up the kind of perceived rules of historical romance and Mm -hmm. broadening it. And that makes the genre more interesting. And this book does that. Like it 100% does that. It's not just a queer romance. There's so much more on top of that, in addition to that. It's mm-hmm. it's a great book. So yes. I'm so glad we read it. Me too. Well, Kelsey, what are we reading next time? Uh, next time, we're not reading anything. What? But we're having a fantastic <laughs> conversation with Olivia Waite. Finally, we talked about it a long time ago when we uh, talked about the ladies guide. We mentioned that we were going to be speaking with her. And yeah, gosh, we recorded this interview in the end of May. And Mm -hmm. you're going to be hearing it in the end of June. But like, gosh, we've been so excited to share this conversation with you because we just had uh, such a great conversation. So we really did. We are so so excited to share that with you next week. So thank you again for joining us. If you like what you heard today, then tweet about the show or post about the show anywhere on social media that helps other people find us. And we are so thankful for all of your support. So again, thank you for listening and join us next time as we talk with Olivia Waite. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. And Violetta, with no other options, decides to go along with the scheme. In for a penny, in for 68 pounds. That's a great line, Zoe. Sorry. That was just a great (laughs) line. Good for you. Like, that's fabulous. Aw, thank you. I was like, I I did feel good about that one. (laughs) Okay, sorry. minimize his aunt uh to what's the word i'm looking for it's not minimize it's like to make her seem small um oh i know what word you're talking about but i don't have it yeah i don't i don't have it either okay i'll just say minimize you know sometimes you got to let these things go <laughs> yep <laughs> 
and he does his best to minimize his aunt. And so the next morning at the hearing for Mrs. Martin's incompetence, the prosecution is unable to show up as he is firmly ensconced. Ensconced. And And so the next morning at the hearing for Mrs. Martin's incompetence, the prosecution is unable to show up.